All right, question number one on the impulse momentum practice problem set. A golfer strikes a golf ball with a mass of 0.05 kilograms and the time of impact between the golf ball and the golf club is 1.0 milliseconds. We're told the ball acquires a velocity of magnitude 70 meters per second and we are asked to find the average force exerted on the ball. So there was a collision, which means we will use the impulse momentum theorem, which was derived in class. Let's take a look at what we have in this problem. First and foremost, we're given mass, we're given the duration that a force is applied to an object, we're given a final velocity, and um, we know that the uh, ball started at rest. So in order to find the average force, we're going to use the impulse momentum theorem, which states that the impulse is equal to a change in momentum, i.e. the final momentum minus the initial momentum, which is also equal to a force multiplied by a duration in which that force is applied. So this will be our go-to equation through a lot of these problems. If we take our information that we have and we plug it in and we acknowledge that the initial velocity of the ball was zero and therefore the initial momentum of the ball was zero, we can simply rearrange algebraically and find the average force to be 3.5 times 10 to the third newtons. Question two, there are two trains, big red and little blue. Uh, they both have the same velocity. Big red, however, has twice the mass of little blue. Compare their momenta. All right, so if we look at each one and we express mass as 2m for big red and m for little blue, and in yellow we have the, their velocities, which are shown to be equal. So since the velocity is the same and big red has twice the mass, then Big Red has two times the momentum. And as always in this course, if you need to, you can make up some, some numbers and plug them into equations to prove that relationship to yourself. This one is pretty evident. If we look at some, you know, if we call mass one kilogram, uh, again, it's, it's very obvious we get uh, two newton seconds compared to one newton second. So again, make up numbers if you need to. Question three, a football player's team, um, their kicker punts the ball, you're given mass, and you're given a launch speed. So immediately you may be going into UAM and kinematics mode and two-dimensional projectiles. But then we're asked to find the impulse delivered to the football by the kicker's foot. And we're also asked um, to look at the average force exerted by the kicker on the ball, given the impact time was 8 milliseconds. So because there was a, a collision, two objects collided, i.e. the foot of the punter and the uh, football, we can use the impulse momentum theorem. Let's lay out what we know. We have mass, we have V-naught, we are asked about the impulse and the average force, and we have the duration in which the force was delivered. So using the impulse momentum theorem, recognizing, um, again, that we have zero initial velocity and therefore zero momentum, our change in momentum, is, is rather straightforward where we're given an impulse. We have everything we need to solve, and the impulse delivered was 12 newton seconds. All right, so in part two, you're asked to find the average force. Well, we know that the impulse is equal to the force multiplied by the duration of time at which that force was delivered. So now that we know the impulse, by using change in momentum in part one, 
we can set that equal to the force multiplied by time, which we're given to be eight milliseconds and rearranged to solve for the average force being equal to 1.5 times 10 to the third newtons. In question number four, we have an 80 kilogram stump man jumps out of a window, and that's all we know, jumps out of a window that is 45 meters above the ground. So again, you may be drawn to UAM and kinematics, but I mean, we don't know um, his launch, you know, his the angle at which he jumps relative to the floor. Um, we don't know any of this. We don't know. It says he jumps out. He doesn't step off of a rooftop. And so th there's uh, several assumptions that we really cannot make in this problem. Um, so we're asked, how fast is he falling when he reaches the ground? Okay, well, we do know a way to find that speed. And we do know that the work energy theorem is independent of the path taken. So it wouldn't really matter in this case how he had jumped out because we have information about the overall event. We know that his mass, we know the change in vertical displacement, and we're asked to essentially find the final velocity vertically. So that means we can set our gravitational potential energy and we can set that equal to our kinetic energy. And given that energy is conserved within this system, we can solve uh, fairly straightforward by a canceling mass on both sides. So mass doesn't matter. We have the, the height. Again, we need to acknowledge some assumptions about how this man jumps out of the out of the building and through the window but we're going to use a height of 45 meters given to us in the problem since we have no other information um, the acceleration due to gravity multiply both sides by two take the square root and we have the final velocity of the stump man to be 30 meters per second, and that would be the magnitude of the velocity. Part B, so that is the answer to part A. All right, so part A is um, 30 meters per second, and part B, he lands on a large air-filled target, coming to rest in 1.5 seconds, so that means the duration of the stunt man's impact is 1.5 seconds. Notice impact, impact. There was a collision. We're going to be using the impulse momentum theorem because two objects have collided. A stunt man and a large air filled target have collided. We're given the duration that time and we're asked to find the average force. So we know that the change in momentum is equal to the force multiplied by the time that force is delivered. We know change in momentum is um, mass velocity final minus mass velocity initial. And we have um, an intuition that is, okay, in this case, during the impact, we found his initial velocity and his final velocity is zero. This is during the collision. So with that in mind, we're able to say zero minus the momentum. Remember, we found the velocity in part A and is equal to force, 1.5 seconds. Algebraically rearrange that to say, therefore, the average force exerted on the stump man's body during this collision is 1,600 newtons. But in part C, what if he landed on a hard ground and his impact time was a fraction of a second? In fact, it was only 10 milliseconds. How would that impact the force delivered to his body? So from a mathematical reasoning standpoint, we're going to be dividing 
by this impact time. And if we have a really small number in the denominator, that's going to give us a really large average force. Mathematically, let's look at this by plugging in numbers for the average force with our new impact time. And as you can see, the force is much greater in scenario C than scenario B. Again, that is because the duration of time this, this force is delivered to the man's body is a fraction of a second. And when we add that, when, when we place that tiny number in the denominator, that's going to give us a very large average force. Question five, calculate the magnitude of the impulse applied to a cart to change its velocity from 0 0.5 meters per second east to 2.00 meters per second east. Let's call east our positive direction. And we are asked to find um, the magnitude only of the impulse, not the direction. So um, we have all of this information, including V naught, V final. And we also know impulse is a change in momentum which is equal to the mass final minus mass initial. This is a, a, a very straightforward problem. We're given the mass. I've factored it out here, but we're given the mass. We're given the initial and final velocities. Therefore, we can solve for the impulse to be 1.1 Newton seconds. Question six, we have a block. It's sliding east along a horizontal frictionless surface with a given momentum of 30 kilograms times meters per second. Remember, that's the same thing as a Newton second. I will use them interchangeably throughout this unit so you know both. It strikes an obstacle. So we have a collision. Therefore, we are going to use impulse momentum theorem, conservation of momentum anytime there's a collision. It's the easiest approach, trust me. The object exerts an impulse of 10 newton seconds to the west on the block. So it's sliding to the east to the positive direction. If we define east on our Cartesian plane as positive, then west would be negative. And this object is exerting a force uh, to, the, to the left, to the west. Find the speed of the block after the collision. So we have a block sliding east. We have another object um, to the west. There's a collision. We know the momentum of the six kilogram block. We know the impulse delivered by the uh, obstacle here that is moving to the west. So that means we can take our impulse, which is negative. And we can say that impulse is equal to change in momentum. So negative 10 Newton seconds is equal to mass multiplied by velocity final, subtract mass velocity initial. Well, we have the information about its initial velocity. So we simply need to algebraically rearrange this by adding 30 Newton seconds to both sides and dividing by the 6.0 kilogram mass. And we have the final velocity to be equal to 3.3 meters per second. And we're only asked to find the speed. In other words, the magnitude of the velocity overall. Question seven, a 1000 kilogram car is traveling to the east at 15 meters per second. And it is hit from behind and receives a forward impulse of 6,000 Newton seconds. All right. Determine the magnitude of the car's change in momentum due to the impulse and also find that final velocity. So what we have going on here is we have something from behind. So this impulse is in the same direction that the car was traveling. So the car is traveling to the east. The impulse is coming from behind and directly behind. And so it is also to the east. And that's why we're using the term forward. So it's in that positive direction. Um, we're given 
the uh, magnitude and direction for that matter, and we're asked to find its change of momentum and its imp um, final speed. So impulse momentum theorem, we have a collision. If we have a collision, we're gonna be using this. And so we know that the uh, change of momentum is the final momentum minus the initial momentum. Well, we don't know the initial velocity, but we know the mass, but we do know, um, ex excuse me, we don't know the final velocity, but we do know the initial velocity is 15 meters per second to the east. So we can actually find the final vo velocity by saying our impulse of 6,000 newton seconds is equal to the change in momentum. Well, if we add 15,000 newton seconds to both sides, that's where this comes from here, and then we divide both sides by 1,000 kilograms, the mass, we can solve for velocity final is equal to 21 meters per second. So we already have velocity final, so we can easily find the change in momentum um, it, by definition is the impulse. Change in momentum equals impulse. Well, if the impulse was 6,000 newton seconds, then the change in momentum was 6,000 newton seconds, and that resulted in a final velocity for the car of 21 meters per second. So now it is moving much faster relative to its initial velocity of 15 meters per second. And remember, that direction would be to the east. Question eight, we have two speed bolts. They're moving at a constant speeds on a straight stretch. At an instant shown, speed bolt A has more momentum than B. So let's write down what we know. Momentum A is greater than momentum B. Is the net force on A greater than, less than, or equal to the net? I'm going to go ahead and circle that. I always circle that. That's, that means something. That means the summation of the forces. Um, and that's what we're comparing here. So, uh, I mean, really, if the momentum of A is greater than the momentum of B, given this information, there are two scenarios. One, A has a greater mass. So I've just called it 2M to accentuate this difference. That's all. So I've said, you know, boat A is twice as massive as boat B. So that would be one scenario. Another scenario, because we're only told constant speeds, where it doesn't say the same constant speed. So another scenario that would satisfy um, the criteria here would be that we have twice the velocity. So if um, boat A is traveling twice as fast as boat B, then we would have a greater momentum for A than B. That's the intuition behind the problem. So if we sum the forces, uh, because this is talking about the net force, there is no acceleration for either boat. Therefore, change in velocity is zero. If change in velocity is zero, then change in velocity over change in time is zero. Therefore, acceleration is zero. Therefore, the net force is zero. All right, so they're equal. The net forces are both the same. They're both zero um, for the simple fact that they both have constant speeds, um, the same direction, but we don't know anything else about it. But because there's no acceleration, there is no net force. In question nine, we're going back to these same two speedboats, and they're moving at constant speeds. Um, uh, speedboat A has more mass. So this time we're explicitly told A has more mass than B. All right, that's important to know. And at the instance shown, these two boats have the same kinetic energy one half mv squared. So in this problem, we are comparing the boat's momenta to their kinetic energies. So 
here's what we know so far. And then we're asked whether or not the momentum of A is greater or less than or equal to B, given that their kinetic energies are the same. So kinetic energy of A equals kinetic energy of B. This is what we're looking at for this problem. So what we really need to do is look at kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Look at momentum, mv, and try to make these the same. All right. So uh, we want them to look the same. Then we're going to rearrange and plug in and draw some conclusions from that using mathematical reasoning. So if I if I square both sides here and if I leave the uh, the you know, it, it's starting to look like we have the mass squared. We have the velocity squared. We still have the one half, but we're getting closer because now velocity is squared. Well, the next thing that we can do is divide both sides by the mass. All right. So by doing that, I'm eliminating this mass here, and that's giving me mv squared. All right, we're getting close. We're getting very close. And I think at this point, one half mv squared, multiply this side by one half. Okay, so both sides are multiplied by one half. I'm going to talk to you about whether I really needed to do that in this particular case, but now I see a relationship. I see a relationship here that momentum squared divided by two times the mass is going to be equal to kinetic energy. All right, so I've, I've made the momentum is the same now as the kinetic energy and in, in expressed in terms of momentum, which will allow us ultimately to answer this problem, which we are trying to compare the momentum between these two. All right, let's move forward. So, therefore, we can say kinetic energy is equal to p squared 2, all right? And if we continue analyzing this, kinetic energy of A, we're told is equal to B, all right? So, continuing on, the, the momentum of A squared over MA is equal to the momentum of B squared over MB. Now you might say, okay, where did the one half, where did the two in the denominator go? I can keep it, but it doesn't matter in this case, just like the one halves didn't matter up here. Okay, one half of this value is equal to one half of this value. Multiply both sides by two. This here equals this, all right? It's okay either way. And I don't want to confuse you by saying that, but I think you can see that quite simply. If we multiply both sides by two, these are the same. So I can put this down here or I can leave it because it's a common factor in that denominator. So um, comparing these two, I can then rearrange and look at the momentum of A. That's what we're asked about, the momentum of speedboat A. So I finally have a mathematical expression I can use to answer this problem. Again, to prove a point, you can put these twos here if you would like, but they'll, they'll just cancel out anyways, so um, we don't need to, to, to really worry about them. But whichever way works for you is great for me. So momentum A squared is equal to the ratio of the mass of boat A divided by the mass of boat B multiplied by the momentum of b squared. So the question becomes, is the momentum of a greater? Well, think about it. If the mass of a is greater, make up numbers here. Let's say this is four and this is two. This is going to give you, this ratio is going to be equal to two. So this is then saying, if, if with these numbers we made up, that the momentum of A squared is equal to the momentum of B squared times 2 in this case. It's twice the momentum. All right? 
So you can make up any numbers you want, but one thing you must satisfy is mass A is greater than mass B. So no matter what you do, this side of the equation is going to be greater, okay? No matter what you do, you could put in a, uh, I can't put in a one over two, that doesn't, that's not what we're told here. So it has to be a greater number in the numerator than the denominator. And anytime you do that, put a two over a one, it's twice as big, you know, just, I think you get the point, but I really wanna make sure because this problem is a little tricky. All right, um, another way to look at it is we can have, and again, with this little two issue here, we can put it in, um, but it doesn't matter. So we have kinetic energy of A, and we have that expressed in terms of mass and momentum, and B expressed in terms of mass and momentum, all right? And you can see here, if mass A is greater than mass B, then momentum A must be greater than momentum B, all right? Mass A, mass B, they're both in the denominator. So if this value is greater and we're saying these are the same, the kinetic energies are the same. So you can make up any numbers you want, but in order for the, these kinetic energies to be equal, there must be a greater um, momentum for A if A is more massive, which it is. So if the number in the <clears throat> um, denominator is greater, then the denominator in the numerator must also be greater to satisfy the fact that the kinetic energies are equal. So there's two ways um, to conceptualize this problem to draw some conclusions about kinetic energy when compared to momentum, which is a pretty uh, typical question in this course. So you wanna be sure you understand one of these ways and that it'll work for you. As always, I'd be glad to go over them with you again in class. Question 10, a small block of mass 0.07 kilograms is initially at rest, V naught equals zero. It's struck by an impulsive force of F, a duration of that force. We have a collision. If we have a collision, we're gonna use impulse momentum theorem and the conservation of momentum. All right, we're given the time 10 milliseconds. The strength of the force varies. It is not an average force. We've been dealing with that in previous problems. F bar, the force with the bar over the top is the average force. This force varies, but we're given a force as a function of time graph. So what we're going to do with these graphs as the preceding fact on the problem set clearly states, we're going to find the area under this graph because the area under this graph is equal to the impulse, is equal to the change in momentum. And if we find that, we can easily find the resulting speed given that the initial speed was zero. So looking at the area under here and comparing that and acknowledging that that is the change in momentum, that is the impulse. We can then add a triangle to a rectangle to a triangle. Don't forget we need to convert milliseconds um, so in the final computation, make sure you bump that decimal uh, three to the left because we're dealing with newtons, which are derived units off based on the SI um, unit for length, the meter. So you need to get everything, or excuse me, um, seconds, but you know what I meant, meters, seconds, kilograms. You need to get everything into those units for this problem. Um, so the impulse is equal to 0.14 newton seconds. Now, with that information, we can set that equal, 0.14 newton seconds is equal to the change in momentum. We know the mass, we know the initial momentum is zero, which means we can divide both sides by the mass to get our final velocity for this small block to be 
two meters per second. All right, in question 11, a teacher whose weight is 900 newtons jumps vertically from rest while standing on a platform form scale. The scale reading as a function of time is given, and you're asked to find the impulse given to the teacher along with the speed at which the teacher leaves the scale. So if I haven't already done this in class, I have a scale that we can hook up to the Logger Pro software, and we can essentially replicate this graph and get an idea for what's going on. In case we have not yet done that, this first part of the graph from, from uh, time equals 2 to time equals 2.5, the teacher is standing on the scale. The scale reads 900 newtons, which means we know the mass of the teacher is 90 kilograms. After 2.5, where we see this dip, that's where the teacher is actually bending his or her knees. And then we have the um, impulse that is delivered as the teacher jumps off of the scale. And then the scale goes to zero. So what we need to do is, uh, is mark a couple or several rather benchmark points here that we're going to be using. We're going to be using in the middle that 900 Newton. We're going to be using our approximate maximum force delivered as well as the the um, smallest force delivered. So um, as we've done throughout physics thus far, we're going to look at the net force, all right? So the net force multiplied by the duration of time is the impulse. Well, when we find the net force, we sum the forces. Looking at this graph, we want our 900 Newton um, line in the middle to be our sort of, our, that's our baseline. So we need anything beneath that, we're going to subtract from what is above that. Now, this graph looks like you need some calculus. However, as you know, in AP Physics 1, all you need to know for finding the area under is how to find the area of triangles, rectangles, squares. So we're going to call these two regions that are being highlighted now triangles, okay? And we're going to subtract one from the other, all right? It's basically, we need to subtract the area in red from the whole area above that 900 Newton. However, if you approximate some numbers here, you'll find that these impulses are the same. So we are actually able to cancel out those impulses. So the blue and the red areas will cancel, which leaves us with the area of interest. This is the overall net force multiplied by a time that will give us the impulse delivered to the teacher. Now, um, for the, you know, the time here, we go from about three, um, we add one tenth, two tenths, about 0 0.25 seconds for the force, we go from our 900 range up and we go about 900 Newtons above that starting baseline. So that gives us an approximate impulse of 220 Newton seconds. Now to find the speed at which the teacher leaves the scale, we're simply gonna say, okay, impulse is equal to change in momentum. Change in momentum is equal to the momentum final minus the momentum initial. Well, in this case here, momentum initial is zero. So because the velocity is zero, and so rearranging algebraically and solving for velocity final, we can determine that the teacher leaves the scale with a speed of 2.4 meters per second. Question 12, we have a, a ranking scenario that's it's quite lengthy. So the easiest way to answer these four parts is to actually solve for carts A through D, all four parts. Okay, we are asked to rank initial momentum, impulse that is applied, final momentum, final velocity. So let's get started looking at the initial momentum. You're given the mass, you're given the V-naught, so this is a plug and chug with these four initial momentum. In part two, you're asked to find the impulse. Well, you're also given the force exerted on the cart and the duration of time that force was exerted. Therefore, multiplying force by that time will give us the impulses for A through D. 
In part three, you're going to look at the fact that impulse is equal to m um, to our final momentum minus our initial momentum. If you add the initial momentum to both sides, that's where this comes from here. Okay, just so you know. So um, adding the impulse to the initial momentum gives us the following final momenta, A through D. And lastly, the final velocity for A through D, we're simply going to um, divide by the mass. So in that case here, we take all of our values that we found in 3, and we simply divide by the mass of each cart to, to get their final velocity. So our final rankings here are given below. I'll let you pause and look at those to make sure they align, but they, they are all... Um, they will all align with what's in these calculations here. In question 13, uh, we have an object that's moving to the right. We're given its speed. It experiences a force as shown in this graph. What is the object's speed and direction after the force? What do we do with the force time graph? Well, we're going to find the area under. In this case, we have a, a, a nice little... Um, square here that we're going to find the area under. And so looking at what data we have, we have mass, we have V naught, we're asked for V final, and we know that the area under gives us the impulse. We know that the impulse is equal to momentum final minus momentum initial, which will allow us to solve for final velocity. So finding this area under, we have one half of a second um, multiplied by 2 force times time, that's 1 newton second. So our impulse um, from this force is 1 newton second, okay? So the area under, again, gives us 1 newton second. We can take that and um, set that equal to the change in momenta. We can then rearrange this and solve for velocity final to get 1.5 meters per second to the right, a positive 1.5 meters per second, calling to the right positive. Question 14, we have a 2,000 kilogram car. It's traveling at 20 meters per second, and it collides with a 1,000 kilogram car that is at rest. If the 2,000 kilogram car has a velocity of 6.67 meters per second after the collision, what is the velocity of the 1,000 kilogram vehicle after the collision. So this is a classic application of the conservation of momentum, where our initial momenta equal our final momenta. What do we have initially? Well, we have a, a car traveling at 20 meters per second, and it runs into a car at rest. So the second car has zero initial momentum. We can set those equal to the final momentum. And so we have the 2,000 kilogram vehicle and we're given its final velocity. So that will allow us to solve for the final velocity of the 1,000 kilogram vehicle. So any predictions as to which way that vehicle will be moving, well, it's gonna be moving at 26.7 meters per second. OK, so that will be the final velocity of that thousand kilogram car. Notice that the car that ran into it that was initially going 20 meters per second is two times. It's twice as massive as the vehicle it runs into. So while the larger uh, vehicle has a, a final speed of only 6.67 meters per second, the other vehicle, which was initially at rest, is now moving off to the right at 26.7 meters per second. In question 15, we have an astronaut floating in space. Uh, sta she's stationary, and her shuttle, she, she realizes the cord that was supposed to attach her to the ship is disconnected. All right. Her total mass, including the tool, is 91 kilograms. She reaches in her pocket 
She pulls out a one kilogram metal tool and she throws it out into space with a velocity of nine meters per second directly away from her, okay? And a di directly away from her ship. You're told her ship is 10 meters away. How long does it take for her to reach? All right, so we're going to use conservation of momentum here, where our initial momenta equal our final momenta. So what do we have initially? We have a, a an astronaut with a tool stationary in space. So there is no initial momentum because there's no initial velocity. But we can set that equal to our final momenta. So in the end, we have a 90 kilogram astronaut that will have some velocity opposite of the direction she threw the tool. And then we have our tool, of course, that's moving off to the right with a given momentum of uh, nine Newton seconds. So this allows us to solve for the final velocity. Final velocity here, negative nine Newton seconds. All right, and that is equal to 90 kilograms velocity final for the astronaut. Let's divide both sides by 90 kilograms to find out that our astronaut is moving um, with a velocity of 0 0.1 meters per second to the left or in the opposite direction, which she threw the tool. Now let's use kinematics to simply find how long it'll take her to go 10 meters and we determine that it will take her 100 seconds to get back to safety and back to her ship. Question 16, on a snow covered road, a car with a mass of 1100 kilograms collides head on with a van moving and the van has a mass of 2500 kilograms and is traveling eight meters per second. As a result, the vehicles lock together and immediately come to a rest. So we have a perfectly inelastic collision that occurs here, and they immediately come to a rest. Calculate the speed of the car immediately before the collision. Okay, so another classic application of conservation of momentum where initial equals final. So we have, <clears throat> uh, because we have a perfectly inelastic collision, you must add the masses for the final momentum because those are now going to move off as a system and share a common velocity of v sub f all right so let's plug in some numbers here we have we're trying to find the initial velocity of the car we have the initial velocity of the van note the signage it really wouldn't matter but in this case here, I'm saying the car's moving to the right, so the van's moving to the left. If you switch the signage, because it doesn't explicitly say, big deal, it still works, but you still need to definitely include signage in this problem. So um, those momenta will equal the mass of the system, of the van car system, but their velocity is zero. So we have zero final momentum. This will allow us algebraically to solve for the velocity of the car initially as being positive 18.2 meters per second. Question 17. A 70 kilogram hockey player is skating east on an ice rink and is hit by... A 0 0.1 kilogram puck moving west. The puck exerts a 50 Newton westward force on the player. Determine the force that the player exerts back onto the puck during the collision. Remember, remember please, there will absolutely be questions about Newton's third law force pairs. Always be mindful, keep that in mind, all right? Between these two objects, if the puck exerts a, a, a 50 Newton force on the skater westward, then the, the skater exerts a 50 Newton eastward force onto the puck. 
Newton's third law, force pairs. In question 18, we have a four kilogram rifle and it fires a 20 gram bullet. We're gonna be changing that into kilograms with a velocity of 300 meters per second. Find the recoil velocity of the rifle, okay? So in doing this, we're gonna look at um, basically, once again, conservation of momentum, all right? Except in this instance, if we look at our initial momenta, there neither one is moving, okay? We know the mass of the gun, um, of the rifle. We know the mass of the bullet, but initially they have zero momenta because there's zero velocity um, for both the rifle and the bullet. However, that's going to be equal to their final momentum. So in our final momentum, we can go ahead and look at those as being the, the mass multiplied by velocity final of, um, of the rifle. That's what we're trying to find, that recoil. We know there's a bullet moving off to the right in the schematic, so the velocity of the recoil for the rifle will be to the left, okay? And, and so we've converted the mass of the bullet into kilograms, and we have that speed to the right. Now we can rearrange and solve for velocity final, which is going to be equal to 0 0.15 meters per second to the left, or negative 1.5 meters per second. Bullets moving to the right, rifle recoils to the left. Look at the differences in their velocities. Look at their differences in mass and think about the conservation of momentum in this problem. Question 19. A wooden block of mass one sits on a floor attached to a spring and it's in an equilibrium position. A bullet, mass M2, is fired with a velocity V into the block. It remains embedded in the block. In other words, we have a perfectly um, inelastic collisions where they're sticking together. Derive an equation for the maximum displacement of the spring. The floor is frictionless, i.e. mu equals zero, and the spring has a spring constant of K. So we have a derivation here. And if we haven't already gotten to this problem, um, excuse me, this lab, this is one of our labs where we look at a ballistic pendulum. Um, this is very similar, except instead of a pendulum, we're firing an object, uh, in this case, into a block on a spring. Okay, so... Let's get started here with uh, basically figuring out how we're going to do this. We know there's a collision. We know we're going to use conservation of momentum. There's a collision between a block and a bullet. We also know we're going to be using some energy arguments here as we, um, you know, we have a spring and we're asked about kinetic energy as well. And that's what we're going to need to, to use to ultimately derive an expression for x, the displacement of the spring. All right, so, um, so laying this out here, we have our um, mass one and our mass two as specified in the problem. All right, so the, the block is mass one and the bullet is mass two. They stick together and they move off with a shared final velocity. Now that shared final velocity of the bullet block system is going to become our initial velocities when we use energy arguments to ultimately solve uh, or derive an expression for x, the displacement of the spring. So this is our starting equation for conservation of momentum. Now, as you now know, we're not plugging in numbers here. We're going to start rearranging this expression. So velocity 1 well, that was the velocity of the block. It's not moving initially, so that is equal to zero. The bullet of mass two and velocity of V is moving. It's moving off to the right, so it has momentum. That momentum is going to be equal to the momentum of the bullet block system after the collision. So we have mass one plus mass two and that shared final velocity. Well, the shared 
final velocity if we rearrange and solve for V sub F. In other words, let's divide both sides by the mass of the system to get VF is going to be equal to the mass of the bullet multiplied by its velocity divided by the sum of the mass of the bullet and the block. So that is now going to be our initial velocity using energy arguments. So as you can see here, we're going to take this expression circled in yellow and we are going to plug it in and square it. It is now going to become a part of kinetic energy. It's the kinetic energy of the bullet block system. And now we can use energy arguments and say, all right, our initial energy, which is kinetic energy, let's set it equal to spring potential energy, one half kx squared. So let's look at deriving this expression further. So one half mv squared equals one half kx squared using energy arguments, where our, our mass is the mass of the system, m1 plus m2. Then we have our velocity that we plugged in from right here. That went in here, but we have to square it. Okay, and that's going to be equal to the spring potential energy, one half kx squared. All right, now we're getting close. So the next step here is going to be um, simplifying things a little bit and algebraically rearranging um, this expression. So when we do that, um, we multiply both sides by two. Um, you can see I have this squared out here, and that makes it easy to see that one of these mass summations will cancel with this one. All right. Again, where did both of these come from? Well, remember, this is squared here. So when you square this in the denominator, you can see that you're going to be canceling one of these out. And you can probably see that without... Um, having it written out like this, but I'm doing it so you can clearly see um, how they would cancel out. So now we're left with, um, you know, uh, m2 squared multiplied by v squared on the left side and that divided by the sum of the masses. On the right side, we have k multiplied by the displacement of the spring squared. We're so close now to finishing this derivation. The kid, um, the k's now cancel, uh, so if we divide both sides by k and we cancel those out, on the right side, k goes away. We have now have it on the left side, and it is in the denominator. I have pulled from under the, um, under the, the square root. I've taken out the um, m2 multiplied by v. All right, so take a look at what I've done here. This comes outside. Under the square root, I have the inverse of the sum of the masses multiplied by the spring constant k. Again, remember, we divided both sides by k. That's how k um, got over here. And one of these masses canceled earlier. And so it looks like we have our derivation complete. In question 20, an open tub slides across a frictionless surface. As it slides, rain falls vertically into the tub, perfectly vertically into the tub. What will happen to the tub's momentum and its velocity? Uh, answer using a, a semi-quantitative approach. So we're gonna use a mixture of, of, of words and numbers um, to support our justification or our answer. All right, so let's look at um, conservation of momentum. We have our initial momenta um, here. I have the mass uh, is being equal to um, five kilograms. So this is a classic scenario where you can make up numbers. Keep them simple though. Uh, our initial velocity is equal to two meters per second. And for our final momentum, um, we have uh, a 10 kilograms, and so the mass has gone up, and we're asked about the 
uh, final speed or velocity. So um, obviously, as the tub slides and the rain goes into the tub, the the um, the the rain tub system, the mass goes up. Well, as the mass increases, the velocity decreases if momentum is conserved. Um, and so let's go ahead and um, you know prove our point here. So velocity two is equal to one meter per second. So the mass doubled, the uh, velocity was reduced by one half. So the momentum for the system was conserved. Um, there were no net external forces for the system. So the velocity of the tub decreases as the mass increases. And again, we've used some data to, to support our answer. All right, in the next several questions, we're gonna be looking at this scenario where we have a two a kilogram object and it's accelerating. A net force is applied to it during a five second interval. You're gonna be asked various questions about what is occurring here. Now we are told the object's velocity changes from three meters per second east to seven meters per second west. So in question 21, a student says, the change in momentum of this object during these five seconds was eight Newton seconds. Now recall a Newton second is the same as a kilogram multiplied by meters per second. So the impulse applied to this object during these five seconds was eight divided by five Newton seconds. And you're asked what is wrong, if anything, with this statement. First off, let, let's calculate the impulse. Let's go ahead and find what the overall um, change in momentum would be. So um, we have enough information to do that. We need to most certainly be aware of our direction change during this event. And so we take our final momentum minus our initial momentum. And we're going to call west negative and east positive. So we actually can, can calculate the change in momentum or the impulse to be 20 Newton seconds to the west. Okay, so right away we can see that in this statement here of the, mo the change in momentum, which is the impulse, this student claims it is 8. Well, what's happened here are a number of things um, that were incorrect. Um, you know, the momentum is, is a vector quantity. Uh, so we need to definitely say the change in momentum, um, either a negative or a positive or an east or a west. Also, um, the impulse is by definition the change in momentum. So, so we don't even need to use time. So this student is incorrect by um, dividing by the, the five seconds, all right? That doesn't even come into play here because impulse, by definition, is a change in momentum. Um, so let's move on to question 22. Again, we have the same scenario. And this student says the change in velocity for this two kilogram object is four meters per second. So the change in momentum and also the impulse must be eight Newton seconds. Well, we've already calculated what the impulse actually is and we know that's 20 Newton seconds west. So right away we know that was incorrect. We also know that, um, the, you know, velocity is a vector quantity. All right, so the magnitude, this change in velocity alone is actually 10 meters per second. This student says it was four meters per second, all right, when in reality it was uh, 10 meters per second. The student forgot that, to take into consideration the change in direction or the signage when calculating the change in velocity. In question 23, once again, same scenario, this time we have four students having a, a confab over this situation. Lorenzo says the impulse is equal to the change in momentum, which is equal to two kilograms, so the mass which he has factored out, and that quantity multiplied by three plus seven. 
So Lorenzo says the impulse is 20 newton seconds. All right. Romano comes in and says, but the change in velocity is four meters per second. We multiply by the mass to get the change in momentum and also the impulse, which is, as we now know, after the last couple questions, um, eight newton seconds is wrong. Amadeo says the change in momentum of this object during these five seconds was eight newton seconds. So the impulse applied to this object during these five seconds was eight divided by five. We also know this is incorrect because the time does not is not a factor because the the uh, impulse by definition is the change in momentum. Now Carlo starts talking about force. All right, so the impulse is the force times the time t, and since we don't know the force, we can't find the impulse for this situation. So. Overall, um, you know, none of these students are fully correct. The, the change in velocity and the final velocity minus initial, we've already established that is 10 meters per second west. So these students are forgetting that we're dealing with vector quantities. Um, Lorenzo was pretty darn close. But again, Lorenzo didn't include the signage there. So we, you know, that Lorenzo has 20 Newton seconds, positive 20 Newton seconds, where we know it's actually negative 20 Newton seconds or 20 Newton seconds to the West. I wonder what Avogadro would have said. In question 24, cart A of mass 0 0.5 kilograms moves to the right with a speed of 20, or excuse me, 60 centimeters per second. Cart B has a mass of uh, one kilogram and cart B is initially at rest. The carts collide and stick together and move off as a two cart system to the right. What is the final velocity of that two cart system? Well, we have a a perfectly inelastic collision. All right, so let's can talk about our initial momenta here. Cart A has all of the momentum heading to the right. B has zero initial momentum. After the collision, we have a two-cart system, and they share a common velocity. So um, as we've seen, we're going to be adding those masses. That is a common mistake made by students. Um, so let's look at our initial momentum that I already went through. Let's look at it mathematically. And it looks like this. If we rearrange and plug in numbers, we can solve for velocity final. Um, don't forget to add those two masses together. And so our final velocity of the two cart system is 0.2 meters per second to the right. Look at what our initial, initially cart A, 0.6 meters per second to the right. But as a two cart system with that increase in mass, their shared velocity is only 0.2 meters per second to the right. Question 25. Two identical balls are dropped from the same height above ground, such that they are traveling 50 centimeters per second just, just before impact. Ball A rebounds with 50 centimeters per second. Ball B rebounds with a speed of 10 centimeters per second. Each is in contact with the ground for the same amount of time. Part A. Use quantitative and qualitative reasoning to explain if momentum of either ball A or ball B is conserved during this collision. So the first thing, and the, really one of the, the whole purpose of this problem is we're going to talk about a system, all right? So you've seen this. We've been doing this for now. This is our fourth unit into the course. So this part A is explicitly asking about the conservation of each individual ball. So we need to consider that, all right? 
Now, when we use a semi-quantitative approach, we're going to use we're gonna, some writing, some discussion, along with the equations, the mathematics, to support those conclusions or justify our answer. So um, let's look at the momentum for A and the change of momentum, final minus initial, okay? Calling um, the mass of ball A just M subscript A, and we're given the... Uh, the speed. So if, you know, if we call down, it's going down and positive, then when it rebounds, it's going to be negative. That's what it means. There is a collision and it has lost all of its initial momentum and completely regained it in the opposite direction. That's what's occurring here. So um, if we look at this and we go ahead and we factor out the mass of A, we get the um, mass of A being equal to 1.0, or mass of A multiplied by 1 meter per second if we're going to try to quantify a change in momentum for A. Let's do the same for B, all right? So now we look at B, we get the factored out, we have the mass of the ball B, and that multiplied by 0 0.6. So you can see just from this expression alone, um, no matter what value we plug in for the mass, because they are identical, the change in momentum for ball A is greater than the change in momentum for ball B. Again, it doesn't matter what mass we put in because we're multiplying that by the the velocity. So the, the, the key here that I want to accentuate is, is we, you know, we're so used to just saying, yes, momentum within a system is conserved. But this problem is asking about the ball. It's not asking about the ball earth system. If that were the case, yes, momentum would be conserved. But um, for each individual ball, it's not conserved. Is it's not conserved. There's a total change in direction. All right, so, um, and so for part B, if the momentum was not conserved, which ball had the greater change? Again, um, we found a way to quantify that. Um, we're also being asked which ball exerts a larger force on the ground during the collision. Okay, so if we go ahead and we make up a number for mass, let's call it two kilograms, the change in momentum for A is two, change in momentum for B, 1.2, so we can further support or justify our answer by making up numbers and putting them in uh, into these expressions here, okay? So now let's go ahead and look at part C. So in part C, the, which exerts a greater force? Well, we're, we're told that each is in contact with the ground for the same amount of time, all right? So that's important. We know that the impulse is equal to a force multiplied by the duration in which time that force is applied. So if, if T or time is the same for both, and we know the change in momentum for A is greater than the change in momentum for B, then the force exerted by ball A must be greater than the force exerted by ball B. On this premise alone, we've already established ball A had a greater change in momentum. Change in momentum is equal to force multiplied by time. If time is the same for both and we divide both sides by time, no matter what we do, we're going to get a larger value for ball A when compared to ball B. Question 26. Two carts of equal mass move toward each other with identical speeds of 30 centimeters per second. After colliding, the carts bounce off each other, each regaining 30 centimeters per second in the opposite directions. A is the momentum conserved in the collision? Well, let's look at this mathematically. All right, so we're going to look at our initial momentum compared to our final momentum. 
We're going to pay attention to signage. If, if one cart's moving to the right with at, at three tenths of a meter per second, then the other cart must be moving to the left. All right. At, with the same magnitude of velocity. And then that's going to equal their final momenta. And again, the one that was going to the right is now going to the left, but at the same magnitude of velocity here. And the one that was originally going to the left was now or is now going to the right. So this one, it's pretty clear to see that momentum is indeed conserved. All right, you can see that mathematically that supports our just um, our answer. In part B, is kinetic energy conserved? When you see this, and you will see this, if kinetic energy is conserved, then we have a perfectly elastic collision where they perfectly bounce off. Zero kinetic energy is lost to non-conservative forces at all. So I want you to equate those two in your mind. So an elast in, in an elastic collision, kinetic energy is conserved. And that was in one of the preceding facts on the problem set. So we need to look at what initially we have for kinetic energy, one half mv squared initially for both of these. All right. Then let's look what we have after the collision for the kinetic energy for both of these. We get the exact same answer, no matter what we put in for the mass, because we're just told the masses are equal. We will get one half multiplied by the mass multiplied by 0 0.18, no matter what we do. So if the kinetic energy before and after is the same, then we have an elastic collision. In this problem here, we have two balls. Uh, they roll toward one another. The red ball has a mass of half a kilogram, a speed of four meters per second just before the impact. And the green ball has a mass of 0 0.2 meter, or excuse me, kilograms and a speed of two meters per second. All right, so after the head-on collision, they move off to the right, okay? After the head-on collision, the red ball continues forward. That's what we're told. Find the speed of the green ball after the collision, okay? So again, they collide, and then after the collision, um, you are explicitly told the red ball moves forward, and you're asked about the green ball. Was the collision elastic? i.e. was kinetic energy conserved? If the answer is yes, then we can say, yes, it was elastic. If kinetic energy was not conserved, then no, it was not an elastic collision. It was an inelastic collision. All right, so let's, let's go ahead and answer this. Let's look at our initial momenta and, and, and when it's conserved and compare that to our final momentum. All right, paying attention to our signage here, which is why we have negative two meters per second. Um, if they're heading toward one another, no matter which direction we call positive, the other will have the negative of that, okay? So I've chosen conventionally <laughs> to the right as positive, to the left as negative. Okay, so comparing that to our final momentum, where we are told the red ball has that speed. So um, here's our red ball. And we're asked to solve for the velocity of the green ball after this collision. So let's rearrange this. Plug in numbers. And go ahead and solve for the final velocity of the green ball being positive 3 meters per second. So it's moving to the right as was indicated in the schematic, okay? So it's moving to the right. Part B, um, now that we know the speed, speed being three meters per second, was it elastic? So let's look at what kinetic energy we had initially in this two ball system, and we get 4.4 joules of energy. Let's look at the kinetic energy that we have after this collision in the two ball system. We have only 
1.9 joules of energy. So kinetic energy was not conserved. This is an um, this is not an elastic collision. This is an inelastic collision. Yes, Sophia. All right. So we see the collision. What's that? Okay, I'll be up in a minute. So we we know that since um, kinetic energy is not conserved, it was lost to non-conservative forces. We know those forces to be heat and sound, etc., as we discussed at length in the previous unit. Question 28, two balls are rolling toward one, one another. We're given the speed and the mass of the balls, and we are asked about the collision. So if the collision is completely inelastic, all right, so we're told it's inelastic, which means these balls are going to come together, they're going to collide, stick, and move off with some shared common velocity. Again, they're going to come together, stick, and move off with a shared velocity, but now we need to sum the mass of the two ball system. Okay, so let's find the velocity of this object after the collision. Using conservation of momentum, this is a fairly straightforward problem, as long as you remember to add the mass of the two ball system, okay? And then when we put in our numbers here, mathematically we rearrange this, we get our final velocity to be a positive 1.75 meters per second, or 1.75 meters per second to the right for our final velocity of the two ball system. Okay, now this is the first of our um, collisions, our looking at the conservation of momentum in the X and the Y direction. And just as we've done throughout our units of, of kinematics and dynamics, we're gonna analyze the momentum in the Y separate from the momentum in the X, okay. So we have these, these two cars that are traveling. One is traveling due north, one is traveling due west, and the cars collide and lock bumpers and stick together. Okay, we're asked about the velocity of the two car system after the impact. Let's go ahead and get our Cartesian plane set up here and go ahead and acknowledge, yes, we're going to need to resolve the momenta into X and Y components, which means we're gonna be using trigonometry and the Pythagorean theorem and looking at um, adding uh, vector quantities orthogonally. We're gonna do all of that again and we're gonna do that throughout the course. All right, so let's go ahead and look at our conservation of momentum in the Y for this first car moving 20 meters per second north. So does it, and in this we're called north and south, we'll call that the Y, we've done that. And on our Cartesian plane, East and west is going to be on the X. So when we look at the momentum in the Y for this first car, it's all in the Y. It's all north. So all 10,000 Newton seconds of momentum is in the Y direction. This car, the blue car, has zero momentum in the X. Now, let's look at the yellow car. Conversely, it has zero momentum in the Y, but it has 15,000 Newton seconds of momentum in the X. And in fact, the uh, vector quantity would be negative 15,000 as it's moving to the west, and on our Cartesian plane, we have defined that direction as the negative direction. All right, so now we have a way. We've looked at the X and the Y for both the yellow and the blue car. Now, if we use tip-to-tail vector addition, and we look at the resultant vector and put our quantities, um, we can easily solve for 
um, not only the final momentum, but also the velocities here. So let's go ahead and look at doing that. Let's use the Pythagorean theorem to look at these vector quantities. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And we can solve for the overall resultant vector. Come on in, sweetie. Say hello to my students real quick. Hi. Say hi to the camera. Hi. Okay, I'm going to get you juice in less than one minute. Let me finish this problem, please. So let's go ahead and finish this problem. We have the resultant vector, and that means that we have the overall magnitude of the momentum of the two-car system. So magnitude being the key word, now we need to look at finding the direction. So if we use an inverse trig function of your choice, I've used tangent, inverse tangent here, I can actually find theta to be equal to 33.7 degrees. Now we're not done yet. Uh, we're going to find the velocity and we're also going to identify the direction using car uh, our cardinal directions. So we know that the vehicles move off to the north and the west, and now we know what our angle theta is. Let's look at solving for the velocity after the impact. Well, we already know the magnitude of the momentum is over 18,000 newton seconds, and we know that is equal to um, their, their final momenta, and that final momentum, we're going to sum the two car system. So if we divide both sides by the mass of the two car system, we can find our velocity. And not only that, we can get our final overall answer to be 18 meters per second at 33.7 degrees north of west. Question 30 is another problem in which we have momentum in the x and the y directions and you're given some information about our little skater maggie here on a pond and she collides with a penguin you're given some information about her mass as well as her initial velocity and the mass of the penguin we're going to answer these from a semi-quantitative uh, conceptual perspective. So that's what we're going to do for part A through C. Let's look at A. Who has a greater magnitude of momentum in the Y direction after the collision? I'm going to underline magnitude as I always do. And I'm also going to briefly discuss what's happening initially. Initially, the only momentum is Maggie. And the only direction is in the X. The penguin has zero initial momentum. Maggie has zero initial momentum in the Y. But clearly, after they collide, they both have momentum in both the X and the Y direction. So in A, you're asked about the momentum in the Y direction. Okay, well, momentum is conserved. That means that if we had zero initial momenta in the Y, then we will have a sum of zero initial momentum in the Y for final momentum. In other words, it, we're, we have zero to start with, we're gonna have a zero to end with. So if we look at that a bit further, we can see that since Maggie and the Penguin are moving in the Y, their momentum must be equal and opposite. They must subtract to zero. That means momentum in the y direction is conserved. So they do have momentum, but the sum of those momenta equals zero. Okay, in B, we are asked, was momentum conserved in the x direction after the collision? So let's look at that, all right? What do we have initially? We have, you know, the, the magnitudes of, um, excuse me, the momenta of Maggie. We have the momenta, momenta of the penguin in the X as zero. And we know that our final momentum, we're given the angles here, so we can actually say that the momentum of Maggie multiplied by cosine theta, theta which is 30, plus the momentum of the penguin multiplied cosine 60 again, where did cosine 30 and 60 come from? 
we're looking at our schematic diagram and we're we're basically finding that adjacent side from those angles and that is the x component of the momentum okay so um, next step here we're going to say that if momenta for uh, the penguin and the x initially was zero that means that the momentum of maggie and the x is equal to so her initial momentum which is conserved all right which you can actually solve for um, simply by looking at 50 multiplied by 2.5 meters per second as 125 newton seconds so if there was 125 newton seconds initially then we're going to have the uh, magnitudes or the quantities after some and they must also equal 125 newton seconds okay and so we know that this initial momenta from maggie must be equal to the summation of these two momenta in the x lastly who has the greater velocity in the y direction well we already know that the momentum of Maggie in the Y is equal in magnitude opposite in direction to the momenta of the penguin in the Y. And we know that those will sum to zero because momentum was conserved in both the X and Y. We know momentum is equal to mass multiplied by velocity. And so from that perspective alone, we know that the mass of Maggie, she's has more mass. If she has more mass, then her velocity is going to be less. So the penguin will have a greater velocity in the y direction because the penguin has less mass. Their momenta, the magnitude of their momenta are the same. However, Maggie is 50 kilograms, penguin is 20 kilograms. So that is our final answer for question 30. Question 31 is a video analysis question, all right? So you should have at least viewed the video a couple times. You're given information about the mass of the dart um, and the mass of the cart, and you're asked uh, uh, to do a number of calculations from this video. First, calculate the momentum of the cart before the collision. If you where I chose, I chose to uh, pause the video here uh, on the left side. Um, I, I chose that because it's right at uh, 0.15 meters and the frames are zero there. So initially you have negative frames, there's zero here. Okay, so that's a great starting point. And then at uh, 12 frames later, the dart collides with the cart at this instant here and that is at 0 0.45 meters that means we can find the change in position over the change in time we can find time by analyzing the frame rate and the number of frames that have gone by so our our final position minus our initial position divided by the change in time we get um 0.45 minus the initial position of 0 0.15 meter we can find time by saying 12 frames went by and there are 240 frames in a second that's going to give us 0 0.05 seconds all right so therefore the velocity is equal to six meters per second let's find the initial momentum okay the cart initially is not moving all of the momentum is from the dart and we have the mass of the dart we now know the velocity of the dart so we know the initial momentum is going to be uh, 0.168 newton seconds or 0.17 newton seconds all right so now let's figure out what our momentum is after the collision this is a perfectly inelastic collision so after the uh, dart collides with the cart you'll find that the frames start at zero again conveniently we have the center of mass marked here on this x and this distance here of five centimeters marked off so that's very convenient and that's what i used to find the uh, velocity of the cart dart system after the collision 
And of course, we're going to sum their masses as well. So our final momentum is the sum of the masses, and they share a final velocity. That velocity is equal to change in position over change in time. Change in time can be calculated from the rate of frames being 240 frames per second. We had 19 frames go by, so we can find our time, which means we can find our velocity and our momenta final for the two cart system by summing their mass. We know that their velocity is 0 0.625 meters per second, and we get an answer of 0 0.17 Newton seconds. So in C, yes, yes, our answers do suggest conservation of momentum. In fact, they're almost identical. So um, 0 0.17 initial, 0 0.17 Final momentum was conserved in this perfectly inelastic collision. Question 32. Okay, we have a 10 kilogram box. It's at rest. It moves along a frictionless horizontal surface. The, a horizontal force to the right is applied to the box. Um, the magnitude of the force changes as a function of time. So we have that graph on the left. A student draws a graph on the right for the momentum of the 10 kilogram box as a function of time. What if anything is wrong? Okay, well, we, you know, this is one of those mathematical reasoning type questions. So looking at the graph on the left, we have force, uh, you know, as a function of time. What is force? It's mass multiplied by acceleration, okay? Acceleration, that's a change in meters, per second, per second, all right? And we are told explicitly the magnitude of the force changes, a force that is changing. The mass is the same if the force is changing, the acceleration is changing. So I would invite you to go back to the first days of this course and say, if we were looking at a velocity as a function of time graph, and we were trying to um, compare that to an acceleration as a function of time, and you were told the acceleration was not constant, it was changing, okay? And let's say it was changing in the positive direction. Then if you go back to your velocity as a function of time graph, and recall if a velocity as a function of time graph, what we've seen, okay, well, let's look at that. What's happening here? Well, is it accelerating? Yes. Is the acceleration constant? Yes, it is. It's the slope of this line, and that is not changing. That is constant throughout. But now we're talking about a, an acceleration that is changing, which means this is going to be changing, Okay, which means there's going to be some curvature. What is this showing? If I were to draw a series of, of tangents there, it's the rate is changing. The rate is increasing over time. So... Um, again, mathematical reasoning, we're comparing essentially if you make it this simple in your mind because this will work, acceleration to velocity. And the force is changing, at least during two segments of this graph, the force is changing between one and two and between five and eight seconds, it's changing, which means acceleration is changing. Okay, so what would that look like if we're comparing it to momentum. So I've kind of excluded the mass, and you can do that. What it should look like is this. We should see some curvature during segments one to two and between five to eight, okay? And you can clearly see on the correct graph on the far left, there's this little bit of curvature which is showing that changing rate. And it's also slowing down between those segments. Um, so we see a decrease in momenta that's occurring between five and eight. Okay, so um, think about this. I'm trying to give you multiple perspectives here, but um, we can certainly talk about it. You should be able to make a connection with the, the motion time graphs. And just the fact that if it's a changing velocity, what would that look like? Uh, a changing acceleration, rather. What would that look like on a velocity? Well, we would have some curvature because the rate would be changing over time. 
Okay. So question 33, we have six figures here. Um, they are about to collide. Identical shapes and sizes, but they have different loads. I'm going to underline that. That means they have different masses and are initially traveling at different speeds, mass and speed. So they have different momentum. Um, the carts will collide. They're going to stick. So we have a perfectly inelastic collision in which we're going to need to sum the masses of the two carts after the collision when momentum is conserved. Okay. We also need to pay attention to signage. One is moving to the right. One is moving to the left. How are they moving after they collide? I'm only going to do one sample calculation here, and that is for A. Remember to put everything in base SI units, please. And we get that the final velocity is equal to zero. So what's happening? These carts collide and they immediately come to rest. And I want you to do the remaining calculations here to confirm that all of them have zero velocity after the collision. They all have the same speed. And you can go through and perform this calculation using conservation of momentum and the fact that this is a perfectly inelastic collision to, um, to support the answer that A through F all equals zero. Question 34. So on the problem set, um, I've talked to you a little bit about the center of mass. And you know in the preceding facts that um, the center of mass of a two object or three object system will um, follow Newton's second law. Okay, so let's look at this one for an astronaut. And I am going to, to go a little bit further in this question and actually um, make up some numbers and use your center of mass formula um, to support the answer here. Okay, so um, we have our astronaut throws a rope on a small asteroid, pulls it to him. So initially, the cent we, we want to look at the center of mass between the astronaut and the asteroid. Remember now, center of mass, doesn't it, it can be in space, all right, between objects, all right, like a hula hoop, all right? Uh, in this case here, it's somewhere between the astronaut and the asteroid for this two-object system. Now, initially... Both objects are at rest. They're not moving. That means their center of mass is at rest, which means per Newton's second law, it will stay at rest if there are no external forces. Well, in this case, we're looking at the astronaut asteroid system with no external forces. So if the center of mass started at rest, it's going to stay at rest. All right. Now, let me support this with some calculations here. So um, the, the mass of the system multiplied by the position of the center of mass, that is going to be equal to the individual masses of the objects multiplied by their individual positions and the sum of those. So in this case here, Mass 1 plus mass 2 multiplied by the position for the center of mass, and that's what we're trying to find, is equal to the summation of those two products. All right, so let's make up numbers. We can do this. Let's call um, the astronaut 100 kilograms. Let's call the asteroid 10 kilograms. That satisfies the fact that the asteroid is indeed smaller than the astronaut. That works. We have position one of the astronaut, X sub one, and position two of the asteroid, X sub two. Okay, now let's go ahead and put these numbers into our expression to find the center of mass. Okay, so we have initially, we have the position. Now here's something, um, a point that I wanna make here is that you, you will pick a point wherever you want and you're gonna measure to the objects. So I could have chosen a point way out here and I could have measured the distance to X1 and the distance to X2. But if you choose your point, uh, your starting point of X1 at position X sub one, 
then what is the distance to, from x1 to x1? Zero. So it's just a smarter way to approach this, these types of center of mass problems, all right? And, um, and therefore, the distance from x1 to x2 is going to be some positive value. All right, so if we put in, a no, you can put in any number you want for the distance. Trust me, guys. I have chosen 22 meters because it gives a nice um, a clean number here to accentuate and, and exemplify rather my point. So we have um, a 10 multiplied by x sub 2 divided by the mass of the system, x sub 2 being 22 meters. If I multiply that, I get 220 um, kilograms times meters divided by 110 kilograms. Units work out to give me 220 meters. Okay, so, um, which means, excuse me, not 220 meters, um, 220 divided by 110 means two meters. So the d position of the center of mass is two meters, positive two meters to the right of X1. All right, that's what that's saying there. That was my starting point. Remember, X1 was my position. If I had chosen some arbitrary point out here, which there would be zero reason to do that, it would be some position greater than two meters, but it would still give you the exact same position. Let's look at what this is right here, about, and this should make sense. That is the center of mass of the astronaut asteroid system. The center of mass started at rest. It's going to stay at rest. There's no net external forces. So where do the astronaut and the asteroid collide? They're going to collide at their center of mass. In other words, we've even quantified this given 200, uh, a position, a distance of 22 meters. You could call the distance between them 400 meters. It doesn't matter. You're still going to get a position relative where, and it makes sense. The astronaut only goes a little ways, okay? The asteroid, which is much less massive, comes much further, and they'll collide at their center of mass, okay? And I can show you a real cool demonstration with meter sticks in class, so if I haven't already done this with you, please remind me to do so in class, okay? Question 35, another center of mass uh, problem. We have projectile motion, a toy rocket, and it's on track to land 30 meters from its launch point. Okay, 30 meters is where it's on track. Newton's second law. That's where it's going to land 30 meters from its launch point. While in the air, the rocket explodes into two identical pieces, and one lands 35 meters from the launch. Let's look at this, guys. So here's our little rocket, and it's flying through the air, and it is going to land at position 30 meters, okay? However, there's an explosion, and we have two identical pieces as a result, and one lands 35 meters from the launch, so it goes 5 meters beyond the projected 30 meters, all right? So this is a center of mass problem because the center of mass of this two object system will still be at 30 meters. So the center of mass, Newton's second law, it is, it is going to land 30 meters no matter what. And because the two objects um, explode, the object object system, after the explosion, the center of mass is still going to land at 30 one piece landed beyond, so you can probably speculate that the other piece is going to fall short if we're going to have the same position for the center of mass. Okay, so again, I've gone a little further in this, so let's use our center of mass equation here once more. Um, we have the mass of the two object system. Remember, the masses are identical, and that is equal to the summation of the individual products of the individual mass multiplied by the position of that um, object. Okay, so if we um, say, well, M1 equals M2, all right, they're the same. And you can make up numbers for this, but M1 is M2, so I can say 2M1 
if they're the same. Um, so that's the, the sum of their masses of the two object system. And then we have, um, that's gonna be equal to, and I've factored out M1. So that's gonna equal M1 multiplied by the sum of the two positions. If position one is 35 meters and position of the center of mass is 30 meters, you're told this, we're gonna be solving for the position two, okay? One more time, we know the center of mass of the object because prior to the explosion, we were told that it will land 30 minutes. So the center of mass will remain in projectile motion throughout this problem. That's Newton's second law. Okay, so it's still going to land there. I've said that several times now. Where does the other piece land? Let's look at this mathematically. Let's rearrange and solve for this problem here. So we have the center of mass. We have our masses equaling. So we divide both sides by M1. That cancels there. Um, cancels on the left side of the equation, giving us 60 meters is equal to 35 meters plus position 2. Remember, that's what we're trying to find. And so we can solve for position two is 60 minus 35 is 25. And indeed, that's exactly where the other piece lands. So we have the center of mass and projectile motion throughout this entire event. If one piece goes five meters beyond, the other piece must fall short five meters. And that's the quick version of answering, but I want to use a semi-quantitative approach and show that to you mathematically as I've done here. Question 36, we have a bullet of mass M, velocity V1, it's fired into a block attached to a string length L and a device known as a ballistic pendulum. All right, so this is AP Lab 7 that we did in class, or we're currently working on this lab using ballistic pendulums. The pendulum, pendulum records a maximum angle. The string is displaced as theta. Derive an expression for the initial velocity of the bullet V1 in terms of M1, M2, L, G, and theta. So your derivation in the end must be in terms of these variables and must be as simplified as you can get it to earn maximum credit. All right, so let's look at our pendulum here. Bullet coming in, fired, bullet was mass one, the block was mass two, it swings a given height um, where we have an angle theta um, from equilibrium. And so in part one, we're gonna use momentum. We're gonna use conservation of momentum. We're gonna say, what are the initial momenta? Well, it's all in the bullet, M1, V1. The block has no initial momentum. What are the final momenta? Well, we have a perfectly inelastic collision. So the sum of M1 plus M2 multiplied by some shared velocity, call it V sub F. Rearrange to solve for V sub F. We get M1 V1 divided by M1 plus M2. We're gonna stop there. What is that? Well, that is going to be our initial momentum for part two of this problem where we're gonna use energy arguments to look at the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy in this two object system. Okay, so what do we have from an energy perspective and part two of this problem, part two? Well, we have all kinetic energy and we're asked about the maximum angle, which means the maximum height in which all of this kinetic energy has been converted into gravitational potential energy. That's what this problem is asking if it says the maximum height. So we have the, uh, another issue is you need to say this is the mass of the system in part two. Everything we're doing is a bullet block system. So one half mv squared turns into one half m1 plus m2 v squared, and that's v final squared. Okay, why did I use v, v final squared? Well, 
because we're about to plug it in. We're about to plug in V final that we derived up top here. All right. And so that is going to be um, our velocity. And on top of that, we're going to square it. And that's going to equal MGH, gravitational potential energy, MGH, but it's the mass of the system. GH, we've derived this in class. If you need me to do it again, I would be thrilled to just come talk to me. But the height of this pendulum is L minus L cosine theta or L multiplied by one minus cosine theta if you factor out the L, okay, which makes for some, uh, simplifies any further calculations. Okay, so we have our velocity here. Take a moment, pause the video, make sure this makes sense to you. We derive the velocity using impulse momentum theorem. And we have the uh, fact that momentum is conserved here. We've taken that velocity and now we're gonna square it. Okay, and that's gonna equal again, the mass um, acceleration due to gravity and our height derived in terms of L and theta. Okay, so next step here is a little bit of algebra. We're gonna clean this up a little bit. Um, let's go ahead and multiply both sides by two to get rid of the one half. Let's go ahead and cancel out some common terms. So we have M1 plus M2 on one side. We can cancel that with M1 plus M2 on another side. We're going to square all of this. If we're squaring all of this, um, and I have simply pulled out the velocity, this guy here squared, I've taken it and moved it outside because that's what we're going to solve for. All right, so I've gone ahead and I've said, okay, V1 squared, and then in parentheses, we have our um, M1 over M1 plus M2, and that is squared, okay? And that equals 2GL1 minus cosine theta. Take the square root of both sides, all right? So we're going to take the square root because what are we trying to find? The initial velocity of that bullet, um, V sub 1, and we're getting darn close here. So V sub 1 is equal to... Um, so M1 divided by M1 plus M2, I multiplied both sides by the reciprocal, which is where this guy came from now on the right side of the equation. So we finally isolated V sub one and we took the square root um, and, and it was initially squared. So we flipped it and then it's uh, the square root. So we get M1 plus M2 over M1 multiplied by the square root of 2GL1 minus cosine theta. So that is our final answer. We've satisfied all of the conditions of the problem M1, M2, L, G, and theta, and we don't have any other variables except for the one we were told uh, to derive in terms of. So this will be our final answer, and this is also the final problem on this problem set. So I'll see you guys in class.